sometimes struggle to get up in the morning or wind down for bed at night. I used to find it so difficult. I woke up with no sense of positivity and brightness. I was void of motivation and spirit. This changed completely when I started waking up with a Lumi body clock. These incredible devices mimic the light and colour of a real sunrise and sunset, transforming the experience of waking up and going to sleep completely. Rather than being suddenly woken up with an alarm clock, the Lumi body clock will wake you up gradually with a natural sunrise. The Lumi body clock has been shown to improve the quality of sleep and awakening and to boost mood and productivity in clinical trials. You can personalise your sunrise and sunset from 15 to 90 minutes with their clinically tested unique natural light and more than 20 sleep and wake sounds. We all deserve to sleep well and to wake up feeling fresh. So if you're finding this a challenge and you want to try a new approach, go to lumi.com. Davey, welcome to the Greatest Music of All Time podcast again. It is an absolute honour to have you back. And I wanted to start off by asking you, how does it feel uh, to have just finished, you know, possibly the last set of gigs um, with Elton and the band and also the highest grossing tour of all time, also I hear. Well, at that time. Yeah. Um, it feels great. Good to see you, Tom. Um, thanks for having me back on. Um, yeah, it's amazing. Uh, kind of hard to believe that it's all over in that way. But then again, for me personally, I've been doing it since the beginning of 1972, the actual touring side of it and recording. Um, it's a long time, so it's over 50 years, you know, and um, it feels good that I'm not only ending on a high note, but I'm ending at a place where I know there's other stuff that I want to do on my own and with other people, and who knows, down the line, more stuff with Elton, who, who not recording-wise, or we're buddies, we'll work something out, I'm sure, but it feels great to be home. And, and over the course of the tour, by the end, were you getting emotional did it feel like the end or as you just said you know you've got so many plans for the future you know how kind of heart-wrenching was it um in stockholm in stockholm yeah the last gig got a little bit emotional for me um um really by surprise caught me by surprise because um when we were playing someone saved my life tonight um because the great thing about our live performances uh, we have great live sound on stage. We can hear perfectly what she, each other are doing. And hearing Elton doing singing the first verse, Nigel doing his signature, you know, ride, uh, the, which we call the trademark. Yeah, yeah. And myself just getting ready to come in, I suddenly got very emotional. And I just suddenly thought, this could be the last time we ever, this is going to be the last time we ever play this this song. And then looking into the audience, they were all crying anyway. Because <laughs> whenever we do Someone Saved My Life Tonight, there's always, oh, shit. You know? Um, so I did get a bit emotional. I got a little bit teary-eyed and, and uh, had to take a big breath and then think, okay, it's what it is. And this is the last time. Let's make it a really good one. And um, that's the other thing. You know, we, we play really well live. We always did as a live uh a live act and um we kept raising the bar for each other every night on stage you know all right down to the last show things kept getting better so um so yeah it was emotional but it's almost like how much better can it be it had yeah. to stop somewhere and i think it was pretty perfect that it stopped in stockholm yeah on well the it wasn't like July. you were getting getting worse as you say um it, it was it, it finished on the absolute high that it could have been but that song um and that album you know uh, the captain fantastic album is do you think it's slightly underrated in the sense that because it it wasn't full of hit singles but right. it was the first album to get to number you know to debut at number one on the on the charts um i think ever right um, yeah, is it it was, in fact, yeah, it was. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think it, I think you're right uh, because of the lack of commercial, uh, maybe radio uh, stuff on that album. Um, here's who I, th well, who I know uh, the real fans of that album are. Uh, it's musicians, other musicians. Uh, for example, uh, my dear friend Eddie Vedder. Uh, he called me up last Christmas. Uh, we were both, I was at home. He was at his place in in Hawaii. And he called me and he said, you know what I'm listening to right now? And I said, no. He said, I just got a new system. 
and I got a new turntable, new speakers, and I'm sitting in front of, and I'm blowing my brains out with Captain Fantastic. <laughs> and I know, I've always known that's been one of Eddie's favorites uh, because he always said he wanted to come on stage and, with us and do Someone Save My Life Tonight and sing it. Uh, we never got around to that. So maybe we'll do it sometime in the future. That would be awesome. Eddie and me, and and, uh, and I'll put together a band or something. But he couldn't believe the quality, the sound quality of that album. Uh, another musician who felt that way about that record was uh, Jerry Cantrell from Alice, Alice in Chains. Chains yeah. In fact, Jerry's recorded a few of our uh, songs, uh, a couple solo, and also I believe Alice in Chains did one of our songs too from back then, uh, yeah. Curtains or something like that. Uh, so it tends to be other musicians uh, who really, you know, make the most of that record. Um, Is it quite difficult to add that into the set as a result? I, I recall that you did some some gigs where you played it all the way through as recently as, was it like 20 years ago or something at Madison Square Garden, where you where you played it again? I mean, that's funny you, should, you say recently, 20 it years ago. It feels like recent Tw for like, well, yeah, but 20 years your, ago. Your career is so, <laughs> so long. Like that era, like post-millennium is like recent. Well, the, no, it was amazing. In fact, that was, yeah, whenever it was, uh, it was the, um, what was it? The 30th, I think, at that point. Maybe the 30th anniversary. anniversary of Captain Fantastic. I think so this year is like the 50th anniversary, basically. Okay, so so that's what that Nearly. was back then, 20 years ago. And <laughs> um, and it was awesome because that on that show, my guitar tech, uh, Rick Salazar, um, he had quietly um, bought a Les Paul, the kind that I pay, play on stage, a pre-pickup pre custom Les Paul. And he'd found this wonderful artist called Pamelina and had her airbrush um, her version of the Captain Fantastic album cover. And the version they, that they put on that particular Les Paul that I used at that, that gig 20 years ago was just beautiful. And um, it's the only one of its kind. Again, you better beware of imitations because I've noticed imitations. other people are, are doing knockoffs, you know, of that yeah. sleeve and it's kind of naughty, but whatever. Um, <laughs> it's not the one. The original one is the one that, that Rick and myself um, own in fact and it's been retired because um, we took it off the road before this this final version of of uh, of the farewell yellow brick road tour because we had another guitar that we had painted which we used uh, during that tour i don't know you may have seen that was one. that was was that well did you have a couple you had one uh, your daughter designed and then did you have that's a, right did you yeah, have a well, yellow brick a, road one as well there was another les paul that that um rick and his wife tracy loving the artist uh, she did all the artwork on it. And again, I played it over the last few years. Um, but that's probably the last of those special guitars. Custom. My daughter, Juliet, uh, painted a, a Stratocaster for me that she even bought for me. She bought the guitar too, which is it's not a cheap item. You know, I mean, imagine your daughter buying you a Stratocaster. It was like, I kept saying that's to so her, cool. don't you want me to buy the guitar and you can paint it? She said, nope. I'm doing the whole thing. I'm buying you the guitar. So we went guitar shopping together and we went to my favorite little uh, instrumental music uh, in Thousand Oaks and we picked out this guitar and she took it home, painted it and did the most amazing job on it. And yeah, it um, great. And yeah I, I used it uh, at Dodger Stadium and again, I used it all through this last uh, four months of the, of the farewell tour. So it got a really good airing and it just arrived back in my possession last week when when my some of my guitars started coming home to me oh, from right. from uh, all this time on the road it's that long yeah they're oh, starting God. to come come home and and well i mean you just mentioned because there were it wasn't only stockholm it felt like there were a few landmark gigs um and one of them was dodger stadium um sure. what was what was that like and and you know how, how was it in terms of everybody's um aware or elton fans are aware of how it's like a you know, a short rehearsal time um, for the band and, and you, you basically prepare everything without Elton being there. So you're kind of in charge. What was it like rehearsing with people like Brandy Carlisle and obviously Kiki D came back and, and, right. and sang again? Well, um, no, for, for the Dodger Stadium thing, we knew it was going to be quite, kind of easy rehearsal and Elton wanted to be there because Brandy was going to be there. Uh, Dua Lipa was going to be there so they could do that, that their record together, which was awesome. Um, and Kiki, obviously. So... We just picked one afternoon, you know, the band, I, I rehearsed the band. Actually, I think I did it 
while we were on the road, like a couple of weeks previously, previous to Dodger Stadium, I forget where we were, but I just said to the crew, let's just have this afternoon. I'll take the band in and we'll run the, the tracks down to make sure we have Don't Go Breaking My Heart sounding good. Mm. We'll make sure that it's the right key for everything else. We'll get all the background vocals done so that we show up in Dodger Stadium. There'll be very little to do so we can just enjoy it. And that's what we did. We had a wonderful rehearsal. Uh, and ironically, when we got to to the, the rehearsal for Dodger Stadium and Elton was there and Brandy came, we all had big hugs and that whole thing. Dua came in and she actually had been wearing my daughter Juliet's pants. She'd seen them, you know, she was so excited because Dua had worn them on a couple of events and snapped the picture and it was in Vogue or something. That's so so, cool. um, so I went up to her and I said, hey, you're stealing my pants kind of thing. And uh, <laughs> so we had a good laugh about that bit, but they're all such great, I mean, Brandy Carlisle, what a performer and what a great singer and what a glorious person. Yeah. Um, I just saw her perform with my new favorite artist of all time, Jacob Collier. I, I saw his show at the Hollywood Bowl uh, last, wed last Wednesday, I think it was. Blew my mind completely. And, and Brandy came out and performed the new single that he's got coming out uh, featuring the two of them. Oh, really? It's just coming out tomorrow, I think, here. But it's a beautiful, beautiful song. And... Um, yeah, yeah, I wanted so, to ask you about that because I saw you posted and you said something like he's flying the flag uh, for mm -hmm. new music. So right. you, you very much keep, you know, your ear to the ground and you're always like searching out new musical things. It's not just, you know, looking back at all this amazing oh, stuff with yeah. Elton. You're always trying to find new stuff. So uh, as well as going to see Jacob Collier, uh, have you been like making music and stuff this summer just, you know, for, for the love of it and to, con to continue? Oh, absolutely. I mean... I've wanted to see Jacob for years. It's only in the last couple of years that I feel that he's become a bit more, he's been out in the public eye, he's been playing concerts and other people are, have become aware of him. Uh, musicians like myself have been aware of him forever. Yeah. In fact, Paul Buckmaster, uh, dear Paul, who I miss every day, um, Paul was the first one to tell me about him around 10 years ago. He said, you should check out this guy, Jacob Collier on, he's got a YouTube channel and he puts all these wonderful things and I did, and, and yeah, so Jacob's a, a, a huge, uh, the, the show was indescribably great. The reason, again, for me it was great is not only is he brilliant, but he's not afraid of using his entire musical landscape, he, all the tools in his, in his box, if you like, um, because he's essentially um, classically trained through his, his mom, who's a, a conductor and a violin player, uh, and a big wig at the Royal Academy of Music and, mm. and Jacob himself, I'm not, I can't swear where he took, uh, I know he, he went to Royal Academy for maybe some jazz stuff. I'm not certain about his pedigree there. Um, but because of this great musical knowledge that he has, he uses all of it. He's not scared to use uh, jazz and classical voicings in his arrangements. So his songs aren't very commercial. Yeah. That's the issue that he's had. But they're really. so beautiful. They're so beautiful that I really firmly believe that they're going to get find their place. They're going to find their way into people's hearts because of uh, because of his openness and his brilliance as a musician. Um, he's already killing it, though, isn't he? If he's he's playing, nailing it. Is I he mean, play, so he was playing the Hollywood Bowl. Hollywood and that Bowl was his was, show. And people were going nuts. And, yeah. you know, they normally kind of quiet and reserved L.A. audiences for that kind of event. Uh, they were just singing along with everything that he wanted them to do, and it was it was a brilliant night. Did did he play everything like piano and guitar? He did everything. And, yeah. I mean, he's a great guitar player. He's a great. He played some electric guitar. He played some bass. He can do everything. You know, he played yeah. some mini Moog stuff on his profit. He was doing the whole thing and conducting the off. You know, uh, the LA Philharmonic uh, were wonderful, and their conductor, whose name I hate to say escapes me, was brilliant. Um, take six were on. Oh, right, yeah. They, they came on for a couple of numbers and they were mind-boggling. So yeah, it was just brilliant. a musical evening. Uh, and his own band, his own singers are incredible. Uh, there was a wonderful uh, South American uh, Brazilian singer called um, Sia, I think her name is, C-E-A. Yeah. Is, that, is that right? She's phenomenal. I mean, that lovely, breathy Brazilian sound and his the song that they were doing was right in that ilk, you know. But yeah, it, see, I'm a huge fan of musicality and... Um, I love to see stuff like that that's challenging for an audience. 
So it was heartwarming to see so many great music fans showing up at the ball for Jacob and obviously all over the world for this current tour he's doing. Mm. And it's, you know, I would think that at the end of this tour, he's going to be pretty much a household name because he is doing those giant gigs and people are, lo- they're leaving there feeling so good about music. Mm. And well, about- when you're that talented, you're going to, f- I yeah. mean, well, he's already playing the Hollywood Bowl so he's yeah uh, it's just great he's he's becoming a star um, and it's difficult as you say with with those kind of you know jazzy and classical voicings but, but you know uh, all those people who do that and who who are willing to take the chance uh, like John Mayer who's like John's the same mm. way if he'll go and do a gig and he'll challenge the audience a bit in fact I think that I remember seeing him at the Hollywood Bowl some years ago now I, I took my daughter uh, Juliet who's a massive John Mayer fan forever and uh, I took the, her and, some, and my wife and some friends to see John's show. And he brought out um, a wonderful keyboard, a piano player. Um, I'm trying to remember his name right now. Brad. Um, can't remember. You're going to have to, we're going to have to look him up. We'll look him up. Look up a, while we're talking here. Brad, I think his first name starts with M. So you can look it up. Uh, he's a monster piano player. So all these little girls are screaming and waiting for him to start the show. And John Mayer says, well, hold on a minute. We're, you know, we'll have fun in a minute. But right now, I want you to listen to this. And so the first 20 minutes were taken up with some really cool, different, interesting music that he subjected his audience to, which That's is a really bold great. move. Yeah. And I, like, I love it when people do that. Yeah, you know? well, he's, he's so talented yeah, and musical. Yeah, and he's still doing he's that. He's going out by himself, I think, now. But also, he did, he did all that... Um, stuff with the Grateful Dead as well. Fantastic. So, um, and he claims it made him a better player, and I'm sure yeah. it did because it, I think that kind of thing would make you really sit down and sit back and enjoy music instead of instead of feeling that you're got to be the one who's got to yeah. show off all the time or whatever. Being part of a band, but I think he felt good about that. Maybe I, I don't know. Well, I, I mean, an, another uh, great um, moment uh, that we all you know love recently and probably will go down in history as one of the great gigs that's ever been played by anyone was was Glastonbury was that at all stressful for you because like you're used to playing like these you know where it's it's all about you and your band and 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 and, you know was there a tight time to set up different sound I don't know Oh, that that was really challenging I mean our crew who have just been amazing anyway I mean we've got the best crew in the world I know I've said it a million times I'll keep saying it those guys are all amazing Um, it was difficult for the band and for the crew for more reasons than one um Elton decided before we started the the last four months of the tour, which began in the UK and went all through Europe and basically ended in Glastonbury, the UK part, um, he said to me, okay, I want to do a different set. I don't want to do just the, the same set we've been doing on the Farewell Yellow Brick Road show. And I kind of went, really? <laughs> I'm suddenly going, okay, but I don't think we're going to have time to rehearse, you know, because... We're doing this. I mean, because the farewell so tour, shows. you probably saw the itinerary for our. We Very hardly intense. had any days days off. We were working nonstop. You know, nonstop, gig, gig, travel, travel, gig, 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 travel, travel. You know, all the time. Um, but anyway, when I realised why. I, I thought it was a very honourable suggestion, but I knew it was going to be difficult because um, he wanted to have guest artists. So that immediately, my brain started going, "Oh shit!" That means like a couple of days of rehearsal with special guests who I've probably never met before, and it turns out I hadn't met them. Yeah. Uh, so and, and was, new songs as well. So it was yeah, it was very difficult. So there was that. Um, the cool part about it was when he first started talking about it, he said, "Okay, I've decided I'm going to do Glastonbury." We're going to do it this year. And I'm like, okay, great. And he said, because people love Dodger Stadium so much, they love the way that Rocket Man happened during, just during the whole tour. But especially at Dodger Stadium, people were just freaking out about Rocket Man. And I'm going, okay, after 50 years, they're freaking out now? Okay, good. (laughs) They were just seeing, and and they were seeing more, I think, uh, more of the jamming and the balance and stuff between me and him on stage where we'd, he'd play a lick and I would play some slide stuff and anyway like and it all minutes. ended with fireworks so um, Elton and, and David Furnish and the creative team they wanted to end the whole thing at Glastonbury with Rocket Man. so we had an ending but we didn't have a beginning so Elton said what do you think we should start with so I said Pinball Wizard if we're going to do something different and he went great 
perfect. So it was great because we were going to end with something iconic in that way, but we're also starting with something that is really fun to play. Mm. But we also would probably take the audience by surprise because they're going, holy shit, you know, they haven't done that for a long time. So that was really cool. That was awesome. Yeah. So we changed it around a little bit and it all ended up wonderfully. I mean, the it was just a, such a wonderful day for us being there. Uh, for me personally, seeing people like Rick, Rick Astley is a dear friend of mine and, and he'd he played the day before and blown the house. To, I mean, to me, he was it. Um, he, he really killed everybody at, at Glastonbury. He was so good. He's super talented. Uh, playing Highway to Hell, you know, on drums and all the rest and of singing, it. singing, yeah. Um, and, and he also did a gig with uh, Blossoms, the right. covers by the Smiths. Awesome. So it's, uh, yeah. he's, he's, he's very crazy. Yeah, um, yeah, he's crazy. amazing. And uh, in fact, when I go out to, I'm going over to the UK for a couple of weeks, uh, the end of October, and I'm, we've set aside, definitely going to see one of his shows at the Arbor Hall. So I That'll can't awesome. wait. Yeah, yeah, I can't wait to see that show. We've been friends for over thirty years, and you know, oh, wow. yeah, and he's yeah, he's doing so brilliantly. Well, Pinball Wizard was a wow. fantastic to hear that, and yeah. you hadn't how when was the last time you played that? Like in Vegas? In know? Vegas for the Red Piano show. That was uh, the opening number for the Red Piano. And did you just have the week before Glastonbury to work on Pinball Wizard? Well, literally the, a day. Uh, you know, and one, of the, with one of the rehearsal were, days. Were, were you were you more nervous than usual beginning no, that no because i mean look here's the thing <sighs> myself elton nigel ray we always we've been playing together for so long we can kind of blink and we'll find out what the other one's saying in morse code i mean we're like so together and then with john mahon and kim bullard and matt bissonette these guys are they've learned to be so quick to follow us, you know, and mm. everything. So I knew that wasn't going to be a problem. Uh, the whole thing was, it was kind of a sneaky thing for me as well, because I've always loved our version of Pinball Wizard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously the Who's, you know, when, that, when I first heard that, I thought, oh man, one of the greatest songs ever. But here's the thing. If you listen to the original Who version of Pinball Wizard, there's not a guitar that goes, ba -da. No, no. It's just bass. Right? It's more acoustic guitars. It, it's like ding a ding a ding ding a ding a ding ding a ding a ding. So we basically, Elton wrote his part around Pete's acoustic guitar part, except he made it his own by the diddle little diddle 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 diddle. And then I decided to make the iconic thing of the guitar doing that that thing. So I remember when we, first, when we actually recorded that um, back in 1973, I think it was, Pete Townsend called Elton uh, asking him if he would do a song in the upcoming movie. The, Ken Russell was going to be directing uh, the film version of Tommy, his rock opera. And so I remember Elton's first question was, well, what, what would you want me to do? What song? Thinking, you know, mm -hmm. and he said, well, why don't you do Pinball Wizard? And he went, yeah, we'll do it. You know, because I mean, that was it. You know, that was the iconic you know, Who song from, as far as I was concerned, from that, from that record, um, from, from the Who back then. So when we went over to Ramport Studios to do it, um, Pete was in the, in the studio with me and Elton. Nigel was in the, a drum booth. Uh, Dee was in a, a little bass area with his amp. And Pete was out front with me. And um, I knew the way... Uh, it was going to be because we hadn't talked about it, but that was the thing. Uh, Elton and I in the band, we never talked about what we were going to do. We never discussed arrangements. It's same thing with Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. We never planned any of that out. We just, I started it with the lick and they all kind of fell in. You know, we'd never prearranged these things. So the same thing happened with, with um, Pinball. And the idea was... Um, the way the original version starts, the Who version of Pinball Wizard starts, is Pete's acoustic guitar, and it's like dun 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 dun, dun. and there's beautiful voicings as the chord changes. Um, what we did over that was we made that a whole vocal section, so they all starts with this vocal section, all doing the same as his acoustic guitar was doing. All right. So when it came to the actual strumming part, ding 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 ding. Instead of that being acoustic guitar, although I did add some of that onto our version later, mm. Elton made it his piano part. So that was the piano intro of that part. Dig it a little, 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 right? That's the iconic piano part. Yeah. So when 
wait for it when the big da da comes in. I thought this is going to be my moment because I'm going to I'm going to do it on guitar. So I tuned my Les Paul to an open G chord, and I played it on the fifth fret, which means for you guitar players, you'll know what I mean. But for other people, it means that I could play a full chord without even worrying about any poxy third notes or anything coming in. <laughs> so I could go, oh, no. and it just sounded like a cannon, you know. <laughs> so that was the version that we that we basically, um, and Pete was astounded by this because he, he he kind of gone, what are you doing? Is that an open tuning you're using? I'm going, yeah. He said, what are you going to do? I said, ah. <laughs> and we did it. And he loved it. Pete loved it. Uh, the one thing that he did tell us and did ask us to do was after about the second take of us doing it and working out the arrangement, he was like, okay, hold it. It's getting a bit frantic. He said, have a listen to the way we did it because it wasn't really that fast and bombastic as the way you're doing it, you know. So we put on the original version and sure enough, it's quite quiet, you know. Yeah. And we're going like, oh shit, okay, we better tame it down a bit. So we did that. We we pulled it back a bit. It's still extremely, you know, ballsy and and, and majestic and all these other words. Um, but we, we, we slowed it down a bit and got it into a place that made more sense. Yeah, yeah. For the studio recording, it seems like and and you can hear that you've done some of the the acoustic or the you know the acoustics like the nod to the original. But when right. you play it live, it's like a serious like rock and roll track and a lot heavier because we saw the Who last year, and we saw them play that, right. and it doesn't work as well live as the Elton version, okay. which is so strange to say about a, a Who track. Oh, I should call Pete up and tell him I'll guest yeah, on one so, of their gigs. So tell him that you can uh, <laughs> you, you can t- uh, teach him the better version. I think it is a better version. <laughs> but but the so what about losing the sky with diamonds? Because that's the other kind of iconic. Um, you know, cover version because right, yeah, Elton Burney write great songs. So what's the well, point of doing cover versions? But that was a no- number one record, wasn't it? Yes, yes. What would do? And that Pinball was, was as that well, I believe. Yeah. But anyway, yep. Yeah, uh, Lucy. Well, it, it was kind of a a shoe in. It was bound to happen because we'd become friendly with John Lennon, and um, he had started coming to a couple of our shows, and he and um, he decided to come up to visit us in, in Caribou Ranch in Colorado. Um, so he came up and the plan was he wanted, he was, he wanted to spend a week up, up there and enjoy our company and hang out. And it was great because Caribou and, and in many ways, the Chateau was the same way. We made them our homes for a month at a time or two months, however long we were there. And we all got on together. We'd have breakfast together. We'd work in the studio. And then afterwards we'd all have dinner together down in the, in the, the lodge. Um, so that's the way that we tended to work back then. And it was just really fun. And we got a lot of work done and we could all hang out together. So, yeah, John came up. And um, so I think after a couple of days he was there, it was almost like, let's have him come up to the studio and hang out. Because he, he was kind of very shy. He didn't want to, he didn't want to get in the way. All right. And we were going, come on, we got to get him involved. You know, this is John, you know. So I had been playing a couple of times down, 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 using my Leslie cabinet and and my Les Paul, and um, you know, I'd play it and then speed it up so that it got very kind of wobbly and then slow it down again. And eventually, D would pick up his bass and, and started playing the, the iconic the Paul McCartney's line mm. from Sgt. Pepper. And um, and Alton said, "You know what? We got to do this." So he, he said, "You know, so John, will you will you will you sing on this if we do it?" And he was like, "Yeah, all right." <laughs> so and I said, "Well." Will you play on it as well? Play on it with us. And he said, well, he said, what do you want me to play on it? He said, you're the guitar player. What do you want me to play on it? <laughs> and I said, well, you fucking wrote it. You know, here, use my guitar. Play what the fuck you want. <laughs> and um, and he did. And we, we were just having a good laugh and we were all having fun in the studio. But yeah, he played on it. We played it. We did it all live, you know. Um, so it'd be Elton, obviously on piano. John on one of my guitars, me on the other one, D on bass, Nigel on drums, and Ray on tambourine and percussion. And we did it all live. And then obviously we overdubbed some other parts, you know, as it went on. Uh, but John had came up with the idea of having a reggae section in the song, which turned out to be a great idea because yeah. we, we, we used it in there and it was great. You know, it worked mixed out really, really well. Really well. Yeah, it was beautiful. It's like way closer. Yeah, it suddenly goes very dry. Yeah. And all the instruments are in your face, you know, really clean guitars and stuff. 
Um, was it nerve wracking? Because I know how much of a big Beatles fan you are and Nigel is. And, you know, when, when you were recording with John or did it just feel like you not were Not at all, because, you know, this is the other thing that was great. I mean, I mean yeah, we're all huge Beatles fans and uh, it was just lovely to have John there. So there was no nerves, really. And it was more like fun. You know, it was it was total fun. But it was also like, I can't believe I'm actually playing this song with, with John Lennon it. and we're doing it together. It was like, this is nuts, you know. So there was that aspect of it. But then he wasn't the kind of guy to ever take himself so seriously that, that um, he'd make you uncomfortable. You know, he was totally, like I said earlier, he'd say like, well, you're the guitar player. What do you want me to play? You know, and I'd Bounce take the work. piss out of him and say, come on, man, you know. Um, <laughs> That's, that's, that must be such a, an amazing memory. Oh, it's just an amazing... The whole year that he... Because he, he continued to, to, to travel with us after that recording session. All the session. way to Madison Square. Yeah, Garden yeah. He came on the, the, the Starship a few times. And then, then we ended the whole thing in Madison Square Garden, which was just remarkable. That was just... Um, I still get chills when I'm, when I'm thinking about it because, um, you know, we did a loose rehearsal, if you want to call it that. Uh, the night before the gig where we went to the record plant or somewhere like that and um, but it wasn't really a rehearsal we just kind of played through the songs and we were laughing and having a laugh you know uh, because we knew what we were going to do you know and um, we knew he wanted to do Sora Standing There and that was thought excellent okay no problem so none of it was rehearsed really at all you know probably the one that was most rehearsed was Lucy in the Sky because we'd played it together that's, yeah, it's it's always referred to, I mean, rightly so, as like one of the greatest moments of your career. Yeah. But I wanted to uh, ask as as um, a few final questions about some albums that, uh, I mean, a lot of people will know about, but amidst all the hits and uh, all of the things that get talked about a lot, there are some ge real gems that get missed. Um, and I, I was listening uh, yesterday, just came up on YouTube to a song called A Word in Spanish, uh, oh. from from the album Red Strikes Back, right. uh, a big comeback album in, in the 80s, uh, late 80s. Uh, what what, what uh, memories do you have of those sessions? And I think it was it just you from the classic band, maybe Dean and Nigel were singing background vocals. What, what was that whole recording process like? And do you look back fondly on that album? That was a really fun, a fun album to do. In fact, the original title for that album, Before Red Strikes Back, became the Oh, we use that. The first title we came up was Reginald Digital, <laughs> because it was the time where digital recording was starting to happen, and everybody was talking about CDs, believe it or not, which was a new thing kind of back then. You know, Reginald Digital was the first was the working title. Um, but yeah, the idea of it was I believe it was Chris Thomas's idea to bring Dean Nigel for backgrounds because we knew we wanted to do this and that and the next thing. But look, when we had done all the stuff that Dean and Nigel and I had done together, background vocal wise, all through the 70s and then in the early 80s for Too Low for Zero and Breaking Hearts albums, it was obvious that that was the section. Mm. The three of us were the way, that was the iconic background vocal sound that we had. I think I'm saying iconic too much. You might want to erase that. Uh, anyway, uh. Um, so I was so into it when he said, shall we do that? And I was like, yeah. So they came over for a week towards the end of all the sessions and we did all the backgrounds in one fell swoop. And, uh, and that was just so much fun. It was great. Um, was there a song where, they, um, where you were doing backgrounds with the Beach Boys? Nigel was saying about the other day. That's right. I, God I, invent I, Since God Invented Girls. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, really cool song, actually. Really cool song. Um, I think we did some first and then the Beach Boys added some. I don't think we all did it. No, we didn't all do it, it at wasn't the same together time. Around I'm pretty like sure we didn't. It but yeah, they were huge. on a track as well. It was massive. Yeah, it was really good fun. But um, a word in Spanish was was fun because um, the original demo for that song, Elton did it at James Newton Howard's studio, I believe, in Santa Monica here in L L.A. And um, Elton played me it. Uh, when he played me the original demo and I said, oh, I love this song. And he said, yeah, so there's a hole here when it gets to the, what should be the solo. He said, it should definitely be a Spanish guitar, right? And I went, yeah, obviously. But then I started listening to it and I'm going like, holy shit, that's going to be the longest solo of all time. I mean, it's a really long 
solo. It's something yeah. like, I don't know, 32 or 40 bars. I mean, it's a long solo, you know. So I had to think of a solo that would keep people, uh, you know, invested, if you like, yeah. and interested in it. So while he was putting the, the basic track down, I remember I was off in another, um, in a spare thing with my ovation classical guitar, and I was... Every time that the track would go by, I would just run a bit more of it. And, and um, so I was kind of ready to go with the whole solo when they said, okay, Dave, you want to do this? It was like, yeah, I'm ready. And it was like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> so it was actually a first take solo. Really? Huh? Up until the very last lick. At the very end of the solo section, there was this very fast flourish. Um, and, you know... Um, on the first take, I kind of blew it. I didn't blow it, but it just wasn't perfect. So I said, "Oh, I'm gonna. Have to, I want to do that last bit again." Chris said, "Okay, fine," and um, and we punched in for that last bar and a half or whatever it was, two bars. Yeah, and, well, it's, it seems to be the way that you've worked throughout. Just very quick, not yeah. too much like you know thinking or worrying about stuff. Just yeah, just recording ideas when you get them. Exactly, and uh, you know, and sometimes. You work things out. Sometimes you do things on the fly. You know, it's um, we're just very fortunate to get to 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 have been given the privilege to record so many albums together and try all these different things, experiment all the time, all that stuff that we got to do. I mean, in many ways, we were getting to do kind of what the Beatles were doing because we had suddenly gotten very big and we were getting we were allowed to do whatever we wanted in the studio, spend as long as we wanted. But the difference was we weren't spending that long because we didn't have to. We knew what it's it was we wanted to do. Yeah, we'd just go in there and throw out some our, our ideas and, and they were kind of things that worked. Another uh, record. So was Breaking Hearts produced by Gus Dudgeon or Chris Thomas? That was Chris Thomas. It was Chris Thomas again. And was that the final time that it was... You, Nigel D, Elton on a record in, in the sense of like the full works, Nigel on drums, uh, D on bass for, for every track on the record. Yes, that was the, the final time. Because it's a fantastic album, but I hadn't like listened to it on, you know, lots of plays right. uh, till this year. Uh, what what was it like recording, you know, those voc uh, the background vocals on, on the title track? That title track's fantastic. It's pretty magical. Really brilliant. Yeah, we, because, we, you know... As you know, and and many of Elton's uh, fans know who have bought the records, um, the backgrounds became super important. Well, I think right from the start, they were always an important aspect of what we did. Um, but Breaking Hearts, uh, we really went to town. We went nuts on it. And we actually did some double speed vocals. That's why some of them are so high. Um, oh, right. Okay. Yeah. And then we did some counter parts to it. So... Um, we really went nuts. And in those days, it was before um, the luxury of flying vocals in, which people can do nowadays. Mm. You know, if you do a chorus and, copy you, and you get it, it good, then you can copy it onto the next chorus, etc., etc. Well, we never did that uh, in our time together because that hadn't been invented. You know, you know that kind of that recording uh, hadn't been hadn't been uh, made popular yet. Um, so we had to do it all. Well, it adds, it adds to it. You know, it was, it's a, it's a number. I mean, that song, like for a lot of artists, a song like that would be like a career defining song. And yet in this discography, it's just sort of like a, you know, a song that came out and, and it did really well at the time. And then right. on, on, on to the next thing. There are a lot of up tempo tunes on that album. Uh, yes. Slow down. Georgie, she's poison, restless, little refrigerator. Yeah, they were great fun. tunes. They were uh, fun tracks to uh, do. Uh, uh, what's the writing process? Because obviously, guitar is really crucial. So when those demos get brought in, presumably those songs get transformed a lot by the time you're you're. Well, adding no, a the thing is about that. When I mentioned about the demo for a word in Spanish, mm. that's very unusual. We never came in with demos. We never had demos. Period. That we do all in the studio. Oh, yeah, so the cool. writing process would happen in the studio it was on these very you know odd occasions that that there would be a demo but not really it we would record it all in the studio cold you know that's when the best ideas 
tended to happen. So things like Restless and all these things you're mentioning, we just, that's when they happen in the studio. When we we show up, we plug in and go, okay, what we got? Let's do it. Here's the song. Okay, I'll play the song, you know, and then we'd start doing it. And that's, what, that's the way it worked. And so like how many songs in a day were you doing? Probably three. <laughs> yeah. So it's at least super three. quick. And yeah. where, where was, break, was Breaking Hearts in Montserrat? Yeah. And Two Low for Zero in Montserrat as well? Two Low for Zero was Montserrat also. So those, yeah, those are fantastic. And, and that they're really like kind of important in the sense that that band that played on Captain Fantastic. and uh, I know. That, I, actually, I never thought of that, that Breaking Hearts was the last time that we recorded together, but it was. That's crazy. And it's, it's so worth checking out for people who don't know about, because even like, a, you know, music nerd like me didn't quite like get my head around that i thought it was like a bit like red strikes back where a lot of different people were brought in or whatever um for, for some parts and then you would probably play playing the guitars but it was yeah and and then all the way to the present day um the last album that you guys made again slight, slightly overlooked wonderful crazy night what what was how different was the recording process for that versus those albums back in the 80s and do you have fond memories of those more recent sessions um yeah that was that was fun it was fun because it was uh, basically the current band who played you know the very last band that that finished the farewell tour uh that band played on the whole album and um yeah there was a lot of fun it it differed from a lot of the albums we'd done in the past because most of the albums the big albums were done residential you know like for example Montserrat Montserrat we all lived you know, we all had villas, villas, or we all lived in and around the studio. You know what I mean? The chateau, same thing. We all lived in and around the chateau. Caribou Ranch, same thing. Air London, uh, for doing things like registry. But we all kind of lived in London, so it was close by at that period. You know what I mean? Um, so it was a little different in the village um, coming into to work every day. Mm. You know, fighting traffic. You know, for me coming from Calabasas into into you know. Santa Monica every day was a major mindfuck, you know, like an hour of traffic mm. uh, every day. So those kind of things change your your mindset. But I thought Wonderful Crazy Night has some great stuff on it. Mm. I, I believe that that album, and I might, I don't know if I'd be wrong even saying this, but I mean, uh, a couple of the, pr the albums uh, preceding that album um, weren't as, as well appreciated or received as I thought they might be. Um, I think this happens in any artist's career, but for, for, for whatever reason, uh, there are some gems on all those records, on Wonderful Crazy Night and on The Captain and The Kid and on Peachtree Road that kind of got kind of missed. You those know, three I records feel, were all great. Yeah. I really feel that some amazing stuff. Um, Peachtree Road particularly was a beautiful completely, record. Um, yeah. Uh, Un undervalued that was very kind of country did did you when you were promoting it you were doing kind of duets with dolly parton and right and turn well, the lights out when you leave that's, that's right cool. that's right and and it was fun because we did the whole record in atlanta and the whole band was was back then in atlanta at that time and uh those both of those records were done with uh when the late guy babylon and bob birch were, were both present and it was just that was you know the band before this current band and um that, they were really fun records to make. They were phenomenal. They were wonderful. I, you know, I think in any in any artist's career, you know, it's a little bit much to think that you're going to have massive success with every single album that comes out. It's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. You know, I think over time, people may go back and investigate other things that you've done when they oh, say, oh, I really sure. like that. I wonder, I wonder what else, you know. And, and the difference with our catalogue is that there's so many songs there are so many Hundreds, albums yeah. and there are so many incredible songs uh, and many of them have slipped through the cracks. But there are so many people going back. I mean, I, don't, yeah. I, I wouldn't have known about Peachtree Road at the time and there's so many other people in that position and also success is a relative thing. So it's like Peachtree Road, where that got to in the charts and how much that sold. I'm so, sure for some people that would be the, the absolute you know top thing of their career. So it's, uh, right. it, it's all relative. But yeah. a lot of these gems... Um, people want to go and check out your Instagram. I, everybody's been really liking, you know, um, you, you're telling fans about how songs were recorded. You're playing and showing guitar parts. Like, when did you get into social media and how did that happen? My daughter, my daughter, Juliet Johnstone, designer extraordinaire. 
she, um, about a year and a half ago, she sat me down. I was just about to go on the road to start whatever it was, beginning of last, beginning of 2022. I guess we were starting out after COVID, I guess. So, so she sat me down, dad, you're going to have to do something. We're going to have to, I'm going to sign you up for Instagram. <laughs> and I'm going, oh shit. Cause I, I'm not big on social media. Never have been really. I don't do Facebook. I mean, for example, there's been, uh, my eldest son, Tam has tried to run a Facebook thing for me for many years, but I just don't have any interest. I've just haven't, you know, Instagram has been different because she showed me that this is all you have to do. You do this, you do this. If you want, you can do a little video of yourself, do that, do this. Now I tend to be very kind of creative myself. So when I realized how easy it was and I could do it with my iPhone, you know, I would just sit, you know, in a hotel room and okay, okay. And put the video app ready and turn it around, get myself in the frame, then play on my, my traveler guitar of whatever I had. And I have these wonderful traveler guitars that I take on the road with me that are like literally that, that for traveling with and a little amp and I'd play whatever I felt like. You know, I'd play some blues or, and then I realized, well, maybe I'll just post it and see what happens. Suddenly, bang, you know, all these people are watching what I'm doing. And I, some, some of them, I was sitting in the bathroom playing guitar because the echo was good. You know, the sound was kind of funky in there and not to mention just the sound, but you know, and, and they, and people were digging it. And I thought, okay, well, I'll carry on. So it morphed into this thing of me starting to do, uh, you know, a couple of licks from Elton songs. And, and now it's become this thing where people are asking me, well, can you do this? And would you do that? And so I don't know how long I'll be doing it for because there's quite well, a few. It's awesome. It, yeah. like, there's nothing that really exists like that where, you know, you're explaining the song or how it's recorded or the, the parts. It's right. a lot of Well, I think there's another like thing. That. There's another reason why I do it is that for me, you know, essentially music's free, I think. You know, it's not like I'm, guarding something that I'm going to keep for myself. Why would I do that? You know, I, I feel that um, I'm giving it to people who, who are interested, you know, and if they like it, then great. You know, and also I do use social media for other things like promoting my own stuff or when I'm writing a song, I might have a great idea for a riff or a melody or something and I'll just maybe post it and, and yeah, people will go, oh, I like that. When is that coming out? Kind of thing, you know? A lot so, of it is your original stuff as well. That's right. And that's what I've been, I've been doing a lot since I got home exactly two months ago. So, so yeah, that was going to be uh, my final question. Okay. What, what lies, you know, ahead for you in terms of, because, you know, Deeper Than My Roots was a great album. Are you going to be making more solo records? Are you going to be, do, do you have plans afoot? Or you're just kind of seeing what, you know, what happens? And you're, not, you're not making anything firm. Well, I'm, I'm, I can't stop creating. If I pick up a guitar... Um, usually something will come out and I'll go, oh, that's, that could be good. You know, I, I'm terrible that way. So I tend to, right now, um, my son, Charlie, who's a wonderful piano player, uh, engineer also, great engineer. Um, he's been staying at the house recently again. And my youngest, Elliot, uh, who did most of the vocals on Deeper Than My Roots, great singer, he's still staying at the house. So, I'm use, I'm utilizing both their talents and I've written three or four things since I've been off the road and we've already recorded them and, and I'm already going, oh shit, I've got half of an album here. So oh, I'm awesome. already into the next record f with, um, the David Johnstone band and I'm also got some other things, uh, happening. I just wrote this song out of nowhere, which I'm not a particularly re religious person. Um, I'm, I feel that I'm quite spiritual, but I'm not the kind of guy who goes to church every week, for example. I just don't do that. Um, but I just wrote a song called God is Love, and I recorded it with Charlie, um, engineering. I played all the guitars and the bass on it. Elliot sang it, and then I got a couple of friends. Um, uh, I brought over uh, Bernard Fowler, who sings background for the Rolling Stones, oh, yeah. and who's an amazing singer and dear yeah. friend. He came over. Also, my, my friend Vanessa Bryan came over and she sang on sang it too. On last album as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Vanessa's wonderful. Yeah. She's just a, a... So suddenly we had this great thing going on and we just added and added and added to it. And I don't know what it's going to come out, but it's called God is Love. So watch out for that one. And um, I'm also... I've been helping a friend of mine, Marlon Hoffman. Um, 
I've been helping him produce his album. So that should be coming out sometime, sometime around Christmas, I would think, or maybe the beginning of the year. Uh, and the first single is called Holy Matters. And uh, it's uh, Marlon Hoffman. He's a really cool storyteller kind of guy. And, uh, and I've played on the record and I'm co-producing it. So it's, That's so awesome. yeah, I just can't stop, man. I'm always doing something. Well, you know? yeah, I can't wait to hear, hear that new music. I mean, yeah. it's, it's very exciting and, and di different for you to be able to, to do that, obviously having been so busy on the road. Right. Um, so yeah, we can't wait. And um, thank you again for coming on the Greatest Music of All Time podcast as one of the greatest. I think you're now joint biggest Whole, uh, you know, record holder of appearances with another guitarist, Jay Graydon. Oh, there so, you go. Uh, thank you so much for coming on again, Dave. It's been really awesome. Thanks, Tom. All the best. Thank you.